thank you for your introduction. Yes, so <laughs> I am a PhD student uh, at the University of Southampton in the Computer Science Department. Um, I did my undergrad and, and master's in archaeology, so I come into this with, uh, with a, a passion for archaeology and to, to find the archaeology in an automated way. Um, so I'll first talk a bit about remote sensing, um, about the automation techniques that are already out there, and the approach that I take to using deep learning uh, and the case study of, uh, of, of this in the news forest. And then finally, in, uh, an outlook to the future of what, uh, what I see can be done with this. Um, so remote sensing has been introduced already to a great deal, so I don't have to explain too much, but generally, like, why do we do it? I guess we want to discover new sites um, to protect them and, and to research because the more we know, the more correlations we can make between sites and, and um, no more. So also, eventually we want to come back to remote sensing data and, and monitor the sites using this uh, remote sensing. So how do we do it? Well, we know already we use the LiDAR data in the area of photography. So don't have to explain too much, but obviously we have the LiDAR data. We can see through the forest and we have the area of photography, seeing crop marks, um, and by using these two techniques, we can really uh, have an insight of, of areas. So why do we want to then automate this process? Um, with, with the remote sensing data interpretation in general, there are some limitations um, to your knowledge. How much do you already know of an area? How much have you seen before? What is actually your interest into something? Maybe you see certain features certain uh, archaeological sites earlier than others. Um, and your choice of data uh, and, and the visualization to enhance your data, how, how, which, do you, which do you use? Like, there's an example here below um, of Michael Donius who, who showed very clearly that if you use different ways of processing the LiDAR data, you can see completely different patterns. Um, yeah. So, the same with, with, with aerial images. If you have also infrared or, or other bands even, you can make these vegetation indexes and highlight certain aspects, but you can never see them all together um, stacked in, the, in, the, in a certain way. So then finally, you also want to come back to the data. So you've maybe put a lot of effort into for a few years into this one area, but then a new aerial image comes up available on Google Earth and you have to come back to it again and again. So there are some limitations to what we do right now. So automations, how can we do that then? Um, there's some techniques out there already that have been, been studied for, I think, 20 years in archaeology, a little bit longer. So there is like shape detection. You want to find certain circles or you want to find lines. Um, you, can, you can enhance that by making a rule-based approach if you have something more difficult and you want to combine these techniques. Or you can make template matching where you create this sort of like, if you want an arch um, a round barrow, you, you can make the shape and just do it around your, um, match it around your, or around your data. Um, but also to these techniques, there are some limitations because they're very costly to make if you want to make this kind of rule-based approach. You have to really maybe work a few years to, to make it perfect for this one area. And then if you want to use it elsewhere, you'll probably have to optimize it again to, to, to carry it out somewhere else. And then you've optimized it to this one specific site. So if you want to then go to a completely different site, you'll have to do it over again, which makes it a very costly technique as well. Um, so we, we might want to do a little bit more automation and not uh, optimize the features, but have um, a machine trained to optimize these features for you, and they can learn by data. So the technique that, that I'm using that, have been, that has been around for long already is now machine learning. So by this technique, um, you, it's, um, you, you, you have your, your known sites that if you, you've gathered with, with, with lots of people already, and you can train a network in machine learning that will learn the features so that, it's, that a barrow is composed of a, of a circle that maybe has a certain texture, that may be certain, <coughs> sorry, certain features there. And then finally, you validate this data 
you validate this your your the network or the um, technique you've created on unseen data and get your accuracy there. Um, but this, I said this technique has been around for long, but it has some limitations. Had some limitations there that you need a lot of labeled data, um, and also if you have archaeological data, it's probably too unambiguous because it's um, it's been used on like handwritten digit recognition and these kind of things. And these are relatively simple tasks for machine if we think about it. But archaeology is really difficult to find uh, already for ourselves. So how do we see these patterns evolve there? So before 2012, it wasn't really used in archaeology so much, or there wasn't even so much research into this. But what happens in computer science is um, the deep learning breakthrough, <laughs> as you might uh, see it. Um, so in 2012, um, a, a paper was presented that improved the ImageNet accuracy with 10%. And the ImageNet is a really big data set which people use um, to classify images in there. Um, and what they used for that is neural networks. And neural networks sort of have been around since um, the 1960s. And the theory was there, but it was never really successful enough. But then in 2012, certain the, the depth most, mostly of these networks was increased, and there was increasing computer power to actually compensate for this. <coughs> um, to make it possible. So this was the breakthrough in computer, in computer science then in 2012, and then later on, other fields started to pick up on this. Um, and, and made it made it possible to train these networks on also really small data sets. Use also image segments. So in archaeology, we don't have an, uh, archaeology that always fits into perfect squares. We have we have field systems that can reach much further. So um, also we, it's possible to train um, on multiple remote sensing images. So you can use all of these things in an automated sense. So this. For my PhD, I thought, oh, I have to, I have to research more into this um, because it, it seems like now it's the time that it, we can use this really in archaeology as well to a good accuracy. Um, so how does it actually work, this deep learning? So what it does is it, um, it learns these features, as I said before, but it learns in, in a mammal kind of way. So it, like, like we learn, actually, as a, as a, as a young child, we, um, when we develop our vision, we also in first start to see uh, lines and edges and color blobs. So this kind of network in the first layers, this is, the, this is like a type of network that we then use. So it consists of many layers. In the first layers, it starts to learn things like lines, this I said. Then as it goes, as it trains more, deeper into the network, it starts to then find also Parts of, this is like an, an, a face recognition um, example. So it starts to learn eyebrows and, and eyes and these kind of things. Then it starts to make more deep, more actual classifications further on to, to find uh, the final classification of the image that it maybe is trying to find. Sorry, <laughs> this is not completely clear, but it's, it's how you... All right, so let's move on to a case study of um, where I've been trying to apply these techniques to. So I'm working here with the, with the New Forest data set of the, of the um, elevation data that has been, that has been uh, used for, um, for the, for the great LiDAR studies here. Um, so I have like a, a half meter resolution and the one meter resolution of the, of the data set and then I use, and, and also the aerial imageries, because I work with the Ordnance Survey, they have a really wealthy um, uh, image uh, data set of like every five years they take new aerial images uh, with uh, red, green, and blue bands, but also with near infrared bands. So together I, I can use this data to train different networks. Um, and so in the new forest, what I can use is, is how far my data reaches. So um, I'm using 260 bearers for um, the smallest LiDAR data set, and then like up to 431 um, bearers of the other LiDAR data set to train. And um, 
what I found out is that, um, well, I, uh, then I, as I said before, I mean, use machine learning, you have both your training data set and your test or validation data set. So how this then works in, in archaeology, how I have made it seem like with this one meter elevation data. <coughs> I have all these, this, this area I've used for training the model and then I use this other area for validating the model. So none of the validation data has been seen by the network as it's trained. So I can see also if it's, a little, if it's robust enough to be, to be used actually in another area completely. <coughs> yeah. So my findings, I, I, I tried this on a very simple network, thinking, about, thinking really closely about having a really small data set as we have. Um, and I found that with this very small data set, it's impressive that we get 81% accuracy on the, on the one meter digital terrain model. And for this digital terrain model, there's been no um, image enhancement. So when we look at the image, we want to enhance certain local relief. Um, the, 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 my networks don't see, just see the height data there. So this is impressive for a small data set. Um, <coughs> it has also seen the most barrows uh, for training and for, for, for validation. So that could be possible why the elevation model at the moment works better than the aerial image. But that's just is a, is a part of how much data I have available to me at this moment. Um, I've seen also that the digital terrain model of the half a meter, yes, it has a lot of less barrows, but also the accuracy is much less. Um, and when you look at the terrain model, the half a meter terrain model on itself, it is very, it has a lot of no data areas inside, so it's not been processed. Uh, entirely where there is a, a building or something like that. So when, when a network looks at it, it, it sees this really big gap all the way so that, that says there is zero uh, pixel value there. So I think it works badly because of, uh, of, of, the, of, the, of the data as it, as it is. So I've tried also to move a little bit further than the simple networks and, and um, optimize networks for small data sets. So for this case study specifically, I used um, transfer learning, which is a technique to train a network on, on like this ImageNet data set where you have a really big data set, you train it and you use the first layers where they learn these edges and, and, and color blobs. You use that to train, to train this network on, on your own data set. So it has learned all these, these, these things before. And what I found is that the RGB data then goes up to 85%. So that's, a, that's again, a, a, um, a very good increase when, when starting to be more for speci special for small data sets. But this is up to now only available for, for RGB images. We'll have to further train completely a data set on only aerial images of either LiDAR data or um, infrared would, would have to be trained completely before you can do this on other data sets. So um, from, this, from this kind of network that I've created here, the, the additional benefit is that it creates heat maps. So, and the heat maps show the activations of the last layer of the network. So what is it actually, where does it think that a barrow is? This indicates, I'm sorry that the image is really bad. Oh, I'm helped by the light. <laughs> so, um, in both, in all these four area, in all these four um, squares, they think I know that there is a barrow, but in the in the, in the top half it says that yes, indeed there is a barrow. So here, actually, here is the barrow, and it thinks it's uh, around there. So that's good. Here also it finds the barrow, even though there is a road there. So that that doesn't obscure the data probably. But here lower on. Um, it, this is, you have to trust me on this, <laughs> this, is a fo this is a forest actually, so yeah, the aerial image doesn't find anything because it's a forest and it can't detect it, and on this image there is really heavy shrubs, so you can't also find it there. And also, uh, I think an additional benefit or visual thing I see here is that there is like the same pattern in both these images, so it has like this, this pink around and this, and this negative, um, negative blue in the middle, 
And the same goes for this. So maybe it's learning something of, of high vegetation, but I will have to further research how what, what happens exactly within the networks because they're a little bit like a black box sometimes um, where you put in some data and you get it out some uh, accuracy. But there are ways to look into the network and see what it exactly learns. So this is one part of it, but this doesn't yet tell us everything about what the network learns and how it goes. Um, so how do I see the future of this research? Well, I would like to expand the case study, so using other, other objects, um, also other areas, see how, how, um, how this trained network for the new forest works elsewhere in England, or maybe even in another country, because barrows, we can find them all over the world, really. So that could be interesting. Also, I would rather like to combine these two bands. So having the elevation data with the aerial imagery. How do we merge these uh, better into networks? Um, and how do we want to use it in archaeology? Thinking more about that, how do we see future, future um, case studies use, use, uh, use automation? Um, and I have some ideas on that already. Um, so basically, what, we've, what we see now is that you really need to be an expert to do the aerial imagery uh, interpretation. Um, you need to choose your, the data that you want to use, then you evaluate it, you process the data, and you, you go back to it. But in the future, we maybe see a, a process where you gather the knowledge, you have your remote sensing data, you train an algorithm, evaluate the output, report on it, but then also be able to go back to it immediately. Like you have your new aerial imagery available and you can do the process again and have the, the training done regularly. And it will just give you new sites where you want to maybe look at or where it thinks there is high accuracy. But the evaluation of the output, there will maybe be a lot of possible new sites out there. <coughs> so we maybe want to look at how we, how we interpret that. I, co I couldn't possibly do it all on my own. So I think in archaeology, the, the benefit that we have is that we have a great community outside of archaeology, um, outside of the research domain. So there is a lot of, like, like, like a lot of everyone here, the community really wants to be involved in, in how, we, how we find these new sites. So there are some, um, citizen science projects like Suniverse or like the Global Explorer or, or on, on, um, on, pros, on um, platforms like Tomnot where it's a sort of a crowdsourcing platform where you want to, where, where um, experts of the, of the community can, can detect these, these um, uh, verify these possible new detections for, for, together with the researchers. Um, so, <laughs> in the beginning, there was some um, <laughs> good point of uh, that maybe I will uh, put everyone out of a job. Um, <laughs> so, why will AI deep learning not take over? Why I think it won't take over? I'm an archaeologist as well. So, um, um, so in this verification of these site locations, we always need humans. We can't just say, okay, the computer says it's something, so we'll just make, we'll just think it is something. Also, in archaeology. We always have to first excavate something before we see it. We can, we, we saw earlier today as well, like you can think something is a long barrel and even though you're, you're pretty sure that something is a long barrel because you've seen it like that before, you always have to excavate to actually know if it is something there. Um, and I think a very important aspect is also to react or alarm for erosion, looting or animal uh, destruction of, of, of a site. So if, if this new aerial image comes there, it, it, can, it, can, it can direct you to it, to, to any destruction. And also this can be very useful in areas where you don't have access to sites like in um, war zones or so. You can earlier start to think of how we can, how we can um, react to that. And then finally, finding unknown object types. Will that not be possible when we do, when we have trained this network to look for certain things only? Will it not be able to find this unique pattern? Well, I actually think that it can find this unique pattern because at different levels of, the, of, of a network, it, it finally it, fi it comes up with a classification for you. 
but earlier on in the network it might come up with that it's likely that something is an earthwork or that something likely is a is a is a ditch or something else so in these earlier stages of a network it can also learn something but then doesn't know what it eventually is so these confusing um, classifications can also be very important to us to find new object types uh, sites really um, and I think in archaeology um, we have to think about what we want of automation like how far do we want it to get um, how much assistance do we want with this so I think we have to do this ourselves and, and see how it can be used uh, to, to the best extent. Um, so I've, 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 um, I have two references of how you can try this yourself already at home. Um, so there is this uh, platform here of Terra Pattern and uh, you can try this out. So you, what you do in this, it's like an, uh, a web um, interface where you select one area, uh, you just put your marker down in this case, they put the marker down on uh, the trail of a boat, uh, the waves at the end. So they put this down in Manhattan, actually, in New York. They put it down, and it comes up with all these other things in the area that look similar to this pattern. So we can do this with archaeology as well. You put your marker down on, uh, on a long barrel, and it will find other tear-shaped um, uh, things of this. Um, this resolution is now only available for cities for the Terra Pattern project. Another project that is more, um, that came out more recently is the Descartes Lab, Descartes Lab. Um, and I tried this out. It's only available, this resolution is only available for the US, but uh, they have Landsat 8, I think now also for the rest of the world. So they will, they are getting more uh, data every, every time. So here I selected a barrow in somewhere in the US. Um, I selected this place and it came up with all these other possible sites that look similar to it, but like not really possible sites, but like possible locations. And you can see that there are sort of circular features that come up. Uh, and like this area, I don't know what it is, probably maybe it's like <coughs> uh, a forest uh, and it's deforestation, like it's it's these, these patches that they have in America of, of squares of, of forest, and they, they have this this uh, deforestation. So it could be it could be remarks of, of uh, crop marks from uh, this this pattern. But yeah, just try it out and see how far you can get. Um, so I've explained a little bit um, about how in remote sensing we we are limited to the data we choose to the to the um, um, to the knowledge we have, and then we could we could enhance this with using automation. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry, um, with automation, and also we can use this automation even in, in in a more automated way with machine learning, and of which deep learning is now the the most recent um, advancement in the field, and making uh, lots of advancement advancement uh, enhancements in many different fields. So it can also be done for archaeology, as I've shown in my case study. Yes, so I'm very interested to hear also from you, what you where you think that this can head to. Um, if you think it's interesting, if you're scared of being put out of a job, <laughs> we can discuss all together as well uh, how we can see this, this, this used for the, for the best case possible. So thank you.